Now it's working. All right, uh, please take a seat. Uh, we're gonna get started in a minute or so. Now that my mic's working. If somebody at the doors could sort of yell out to the hallway that people should make their way in, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, and we have a pretty full agenda, so I'm uh, hoping not to lose too much additional time. There are lots of seats on both ends. All right, let's do this. Um, my name is Lars Eckert. I chair the IETF. Uh, welcome to the IETF 117 plenary in San Francisco. Um, I hope your um, week's been uh, good uh, so far. I hope it's going to get better before we fly out. Um, we have the usual sort of administrative reporting. As usual, there's a lot more information on the web. There's a bunch of URLs on the slide deck that you can click on if you want to know more about things. Um, we're at the ITF, so the note well applies to this session and uh, most other sessions we have here that are open. Um, if you haven't seen this yet, and I have a person in the queue already, Eric, are you testing the queue or are you? He's testing the queue. Okay, good. The queue's working. Thank you, Ecker. Um, <laughs> I always feel like I'm being pen tested when I see Eric uh, showing up in the in the queue. Well, so, that, so we have a bunch of conditions that apply to your participation here. Some of them are related to IPR. Some of them are related to how you conduct yourself in the session. Um, basically, you know, be nice to each other and keep it uh, technical and impersonal if possible. 
Um, if you can't, uh, maybe you want to leave the room for a second until you can again. That would be very helpful. Um, and there's some other things that apply to this meeting. You're being recorded. Um, we, we might, there might be photos taken and so on and so forth. Meeting tips, um, when you join Meet Echo, uh, for those of you who are remote, uh, your audio and video will be off when you join and um, please turn them on uh, when you get into the queue to make a comment or speak. Um, if, if you have the ability to send this video, please do. It makes it a bit more personal. Um, if you have a headset, please use that one as well. And there's more details on Meet Echo on the URL there. As I said, we have a pretty full agenda that consists of the host presentation, which will actually just be a quick host talk, I hear. Um, the usual report from me and the ISG. Uh, Miriam is going to talk about the IAB work. Colin about the IRTF. Uh, Martin Thompson is going to give a report on how the NOMCOM is doing this year. Um, we're going to hear from the LLC, from Jay and Jason. Glenn is going to talk about the trust briefly. Um, Warren is going to have an announcement from the NOC um, about doing something security related to our Wi-Fi network at future meetings. Um, we have two in-memoriam sessions, unfortunately. Um, and then we have the usual open mic uh, sequence, this time ISG, IAB, and LLC board. Um, thank you, everybody who made this meeting happen. That includes, as always, the Secretariat, the Meet Echo people, the NOC for the network, um, the LLC staff uh, and contractors, the tools team, and the people who ran the hackathon. Thank you. Right, it's my pleasure to introduce Vaj Kampela from uh, Nokia, who are the host. Um, and as you know, while he makes his way up to the stage, we could not hold these meetings without uh, continuous support from all of our hosts, especially our global hosts, which is our you know, top tier uh, supporters. Uh, and, and Nokia is one of them and has been for a long time. I'm very happy uh, for them to do this here. Welcome, Vaj. Uh, thanks, Lars, and uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you're having a great time over here. Um, it is our pleasure uh, to continue to support uh, the IETF because uh, it's been remarkable what you guys have done over the, the last so many years. Um, clearly, the big testing time was, uh, was COVID, and so congratulations on the protocols and, and all the work that you guys have done and, and of course, to the network service operators and, and the, the application writers and all, all who kind of ha held us all together when we couldn't be together. Um, so I just want to give a couple of ideas. I think it's been about 15 years since the last time I came to the ITF. Um, and so it's, it's been a really long time. Um, and I wanted to say a couple of things about what I've learned outside of the IETF. Um, and the first thing I'll say is uh, the protocol wars are over. IP has won. IP does everything, OK? Um, we might have thought, you know, can we do voice? Can we do emergency calls? Can we do uh, video? Can we do uh, critical network infrastructure, uh, rail signaling, air traffic control? Yes. You can do all of them. OK, next question. Um, so after we have settled that one question, um, the next big thing is uh, if we're so dependent on, on this network, and I know this is going to trigger a few people, um, are we doing the right things from a security point of view? Because we've now bet our entire lives on the IP network, whether it's working from home, it's going to school, it's our entertainment, it's our communications, everything, um, shopping, whatever. Uh, it's all on this network. And so are we secure? And I know I haven't been to the ITF, but you know the, the features and all the stuff that I, I look at as we are implementing our products uh, seem to be oriented towards end-to-end -to -end security. Um, but we have these, and when I talk to our customers, they talk about these um, large surface areas that they have to um, protect. And so, I, you know, if I had the answer, I would start a BOF. But I want to know what you guys think about surface-to-surface -surface security. And by that, I mean, and I'll give you an example. Um, we see these DDoS attacks. 
And they launch from various networks. They're fairly small in that particular network. The aggregate of them in, a, in some network that is being targeted is pretty large. So the target feels the pain, but the other guys, they don't do anything to protect uh, the, the one guy. And so is there something we can do in terms of protocols or whatever to, uh, to sort of have um, what, what I call surface-to-surface -surface, uh, protection? Um, I'm just going to leave you a few questions. I'm not going to have answers for any of this. Um, but I think it would be worthwhile talking about this. Um, security is uncomfortable when you talk to service providers, enterprises, and all. They don't want to talk about their vulnerabilities um, and, and so on. But, but I think this is important for us if we are really going to bet everything on, on this network. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was uh, um, I said uh, forget about protocol wars, um, protocols are dead. And you know, I know this is not the right place to say that. Um, but what I mean is we've, we've solved a lot of problems and we'll continue to solve them here, okay? But um, you know, there's, there's so many people using the internet um, and not just the, the big eye internet, but little intranets uh, enterprise networks, um, the cloud, and so on. And, um, y you know, we, we here, I mean, you guys are smart as heck, and, and you come up with all these great ideas, but all the guys who use the networks aren't necessarily that smart, or maybe they're smart, but that's not what they want to use their smarts for. The internet is a tool for them. And I think it's uh, it's very important for us to think about how usable the internet can be, how um, from an operations point of view for the service providers, from a usability point of view, from a consumability point of view, is the internet that consumable? And as again, as a simple analogy, you don't need to understand lithium ion chemistry to drive an electric car. Um, you don't need to understand uh, BGP route policies to, to use the internet. And I think we've solved a lot of these problems and it's almost like coming up with methodologies. Um, I could say APIs, but I know you guys don't like that um, into the, into the network so that the network is more programmable. Um, it may not be a, a task for this group, but a lot of you participate in other groups. And I think that's where we have to take all the stuff that we're doing over here to make it more accessible, to make it more usable uh, than, than kind of what we've been doing, which is the hardcore, you know, get the protocols right, uh, make them robust and, and so on. Um, so anyway, those, those two challenges, I guess, were the, were the ones I wanted to leave you with. Um, think about security because I'm betting my 401k on this network. Um, and, uh, Think about uh, uh, the the operation side of things. All right, and again, thank you for everything that you guys are doing, and thank you for coming to this IETF. Um, and uh, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. All right. Anyone, one second. And we have, a, as usual, we have a beautiful plaque for you, and I think this is actually the one you could take home. If you want, or we ship it as you prefer. You want to take it? Or you take it? You want to... I live down the street. Okay, you want to take it off? Oh, there's a. Oh, you want to take it off. Fine. Thank you. Big box. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> so it was probably the most technical host talk we had in a while. So you raised you raised the bar there there quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I, I thanked them earlier for serving the ITF as chair for L2 VPN, I heard, um, which I, my memory is very hazy of those days, but I don't think it was always the most easy of groups. So thank you for that, too. Um, we actually have another sort of a little award going to Nokia because um, we had the San Francisco Marathon on Saturday. And one of the Nokia engineers took like a couple hours to like go and win the half marathon and then <laughs> come back <laughs> to the hackathon. 
So, Samir, I don't know if you're in the room. If you are in the room, we have a little something for you. You are. So our, our awesome secretariat made a finisher medal for him that's slightly oversized, I think. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, um, you know, those of you who are sending us engineers, uh, so not only do you need to become global host, you also, if you can, win the medal for the ITF. Right? Um, I also hear um, we bought all your photos um, and you get the code and you can like get them from online. If you haven't gotten the code yet, we're going to send them to you. And thank you. That was, uh, when I heard about this, I'm like, wow. Um, that is an achievement. I, I did one marathon uh, a long time ago, and I didn't do any one after, and there's a reason for that. So my highest, highest respects for, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to compute the factor that I was slower than you. So. Right. Um, that brings us to the ISG and chair report, which uh, is uh, pretty uneventful this time. So we're going to talk a little bit about participant statistics as usual, what the plan is for future meetings. Um, so spoiler alert, Jay later on is going to tell you where we're going to be next spring. So stick around for that part. I'm not going to tell you, but Jay will. Um, there's a bunch of things on ISG statements announcements and more things we have online. Um, those are the registration numbers. And this is the first time, as always, that I see this slide. So we had 1,550 registrations uh, that combines both uh, on-site and remote. You see on-site, we're just at 900 which is pretty much 100 fewer than we had in Yokohama at this time. So um, this is like personally making me sad because I heard anecdotally from many people that they thought, you know, lots of engineers were going to come because we're in the Bay Area where lots of companies have like big sites. Didn't work out for some reason. We would love to hear from those of you who might have colleagues that couldn't come or didn't come why that is, um, because we obviously have another meeting coming up and we also need to have a chat about, you know, what do we do about meetings in the US? Because they were the ones that oftentimes actually generated a profit for us. And this one won't, as far as I know, and that is uh, sad. Um, we have a fee waiver program. Uh, as usual, the remote fee waivers are pretty robustly used. Um, we granted almost 360, um, almost 250 were actually used. Um, the chairs of the various uh, task forces, meaning me and Colin, have a discretionary budget, and we offer in-person fee waivers out of those. Um, I had 10 requests, I granted nine. Uh, Colin had 13, he also granted nine. And for the ANW workshop, which doesn't usually happen at every meeting, what happens at the summer one, uh, there was another 10 uh, for the workshop. And we had 423 hackathon registrations, and I don't remember a curve, but that's almost half the overall in-person attendees. So I, I'm pretty sure this is a pretty high fraction so well done uh, to those of you who are, will go to the hackathon, and especially those of you who arranged the hackathon for us. It's becoming more and more popular for good reasons, right? Because open source and open standards really go hand to hand these days. And, and that's a very robust uh, program that we're running on Saturdays and Sundays. So thanks for that. And as you might see for the pie chart, right? Most people are from the US, um, quite a few from China, Germany, and other European countries. Um, and, and a lot of you in the heavy tail from all over the world. This is just a breakdown uh, for on-site versus uh, remote. Uh, you see we have, although we're in the US, we still have like almost a quarter or actually more than a quarter of the remote participants also from the US. So that might be an indication that a lot of companies are struggling a little bit with uh, travel uh, this year. My company is no exception here. Um, but um, in, the in-person attendance is you know, the usual like slightly over half from the local, local place. Um, this used to be the slide where we talked about, you know, how many people that we have and what were the COVID cases. And um, this slide doesn't show the COVID cases, but as far as I know, we only had one report. And you have to take this with a huge chunk of salt because um, very few people are testing, as far as I know, and, and probably even fewer people are reporting. So to the one of you who did do that and then hopefully followed procedures to isolate yourself, thank you very much. But our proposal, I think, from the ISG and LLC would be that because those numbers are getting uh, more and more shaky going forward, we're not going to report those anymore. That, that's a proposal. Um, what we did do this time, though, we are sort of breaking it down um, in the post-COVID period for the meetings that we had into um, 
on-site and remote. So you can see the total, we're actually pretty close to, uh, to Yokohama, which was the last meeting, um, but we're trending a little bit down on the uh, in-person participants. And those are the numbers for the ITF 117 are the numbers as of today, while the numbers for the other meetings are the final numbers. So, you know, we might still pick up a few more registrations uh, tomorrow and Friday. Um, the ISG made a bunch of uh, statements and announcements on ether types on the RFC series working group chair. Um, we currently have a feedback period out for the few of you who volunteered to uh, be considered for the role of chair. Thank you very much for volunteering. Um, if those of you who haven't seen this yet, you know, want to give us feedback on the candidates, that would be appreciated. Um, I think we're going to try and do a selection in August. I'm looking at Amy and Amy's nodding. So in August, excellent. Um, so you have a little bit of time to send us your feedback. Do it now while you're sitting there being bored. Um, we had an appeal uh, since ITF 116. So uh, that's not great, right? Um, the good news is um, some of us on the ISG met with uh, Ted and Ellen earlier today or yesterday. My memory is very hazy. Um, but I think we have a way forward uh, to address the content of the appeal. So we're probably not going to go exactly with the proposed remedy that was in the appeal, but we have an alternative that seems to be acceptable um, to the people who raised that. And thank you very much for raising us. You know, this is an appeal is not necessarily a bad thing. It helps us fix things that we missed. And in this case, it turns out we missed a few things. Um, and I'm, we're hoping that the new statement on um, interim meetings is going to be serving the community better. Um, there's lots more from uh, other bodies in the data tracker. Uh, and as always, there's an ITF blog on the bottom that uh, Greg runs for us. Um, if you want to post a blog, talk to Greg. Greg, where are you? Over here. Um, he's always happy if an author comes and wants to work with him. Um, you don't need to be a long-time participant. We oftentimes now also had like newcomers that uh, only attended a few times that wanted to share their impressions. And that's always very useful to those of us who've like been here a long time and don't quite remember how it was. It, it really helps us improve the newcomer experience and also you know, gives us feedback about what we're offering actually works for those of you who are new to organization. Right, um, we also had childcare yet again. Um, uh, we've done this um, ever since uh, we came out of COVID, I think, and, and the LLC is planning to continue this forward so you can plan on this being available um, at every IETF. Um, and, and we do hope you plan to use this. Um, I hear the kids had a great time. Um, I think we had, I think, eight families and nine children this time, so pretty robust take up. And there's a few quotes that I also haven't seen yet, but I talked to some people personally and I, I heard from at least two of them that basically the childcare enabled them or at least made it much, much easier to participate here. Uh, so we're very happy uh, to uh, arrange that uh, for people that can use it. And we're also very happy for those companies and organizations that support the childcare to uh, make that available because there is a cost associated to that, obviously, right? Mirja, this brings us to the IAB and Mirja is part of the report. She's coming over there. And just in, for those of you who are gonna be on stage later, um, some of these glasses are not clean. So <laughs> take, a look at, uh, take a look at your glass uh, while you, uh, before you, before you use it, just like, Inside a tip. Thank you, Lars, for this good advice. Um, my name is Mia Kulevin. I'm the chair of the IAB, and I give you a very short report, hopefully. Um, as always, you find the whole report online. It's uploaded in the proceedings or also on the IAB webpage. Um, I just want to highlight quickly that we recently published two new RFCs giving some guidance about protocol design and protocol maintenance, which I hope you enjoy reading. And if you have any comments, let us know. Um, you can send any kind of feedbacks to us, to the IAB directly, or to me if you want to talk to me or any other IAB member. Um, the other exciting thing that's going on is that we are um, currently have two proposed programs that we want to open. Um, IAB programs are a venue where we um, want to tackle a, a technical topic that we think is important, but we also realize that like we are only like a small set of experts and we need external or other experts to help us with. So our IAB technical programs are venue for the community or to engage with the community to figure out topics. Um, specifically, the first 
pro uh, the first program is um, tackling the topic on identity management, and we're trying to figure out, to understand a little bit the landscape there, trying to figure out if there's any work that's missing in the IETF or if we can kind of connect the dots better together. And if we do that, the work will go into the ITF or where it belongs. But um, this is just a venue to have the discussion and, and get understand the space. And the other program will be the e-impact e program. It's also proposed at the moment. Um, it's the outcome of a workshop that we had end of last year. And there was like a lot of input, a lot of interest, a lot of discussion is still going on. So we believe there is a need for a discussion venue in the community. Um, both of these programs are proposed programs, so we didn't decide on them yet, but I think it's very likely we will have them because so far we got very positive feedback, but there's still time to give us feedback if you would like to give us feedback. Either send it publicly to the architecture discuss list or for e impact there's actually a separate mailing list or send it directly to the IAB or again talk to me or any other IAB member. Um, this is the part where I they thank you for those people who are serving in different positions. So one of the responsibilities of the IAB is to care about appointments, very exciting, but <laughs> very important as, as well. Uh, and this time we appointed um, Susan Wolf for the ICANN nominating committee. Big thanks for that, because that is a commitment where you really have to be engaged and cost a lot of time. We had really good candidates this time and, and Susan is absolutely more than qualified and thank you for doing it. I'm not sure she's here, but you can see her picture. And then we reappointed Laura Thompson for the um, ISOC Board of Trustees. Um, that was also interesting because this is a position where you usually get a couple of appointments and we didn't, we only had, had her name. Um, but this is because everybody is so happy with her. So we were really happy to reappoint her. She's doing a really great job over there so, uh, representing the IETF, but also helping ISOC with her expertise. So big thanks for, to her for continuing there. Um, also, also, we appointed Russ and Barry, reappointed Russ and Barry for the CCG and uh, Tim April to the um, RSEC. Thank you, everybody, for serving. <laughs> so, one little thing um, on my own as I'm standing here. Um, Lars already mentioned blog posts, and I recently wrote two blog posts, which were a little bit related to what I'm doing in my IB position, but like I wrote them um, also with my personal thought on it or whatever. The two blog posts, one was about um, the last ITF meeting, so providing a little bit of a summary there, and the other one was about our retreat. I'm not sure if you read them. If you didn't, maybe you want to read them, uh, but if you read them, I would really be interested if this was like helpful for you or if you would have expected something else, or if you think like leadership or we should do this in general, if this is like a good way to communicate to you, uh, or if you would like to see something completely different, let me know as well. So um, if you have any, any comments on the blog post, just send them to me personally or, um, or to the IAB and the ISG, because you know that's kind of the framework around this where I wrote those blog posts. Or you can also contact uh, Greg Wood, who is our director of communications. And then just very quickly, one last point. Um, so we have a couple of IAB meetings around um, this week. The IAB open meeting was yesterday. It was really nice. We had a very good invited talk. If you haven't been there, just watch the recording. I really enjoyed it. Um, there was the EDM program meeting this morning. You also missed that, that one, but there's a mailing list you can join. I guess there are minutes and whatever. Um, and then there's the liaison coordinator office hours tomorrow at lunch. That's the new thing we started last time. This is just like a venue. You can talk to the liaison coordinators in case you have any question about liaison management because there are usually a lot of questions so just come by if you have any questions thank you thanks and that brings us to colin Uh, thank you. Closer, um, is that better? Okay, so um, as many of you will know, uh, in addition to the research groups in the IRTF, we also run the Applied Networking Research Prize. Um, the Applied Networking Research Prize is awarded to um, um, so re recognize the best recent uh, results in applied networking. Uh, it's awarded to recognize to recognize interesting new research, interesting new ideas, which may be of uh, potential relevance to the internet standards community. And it's awarded to, rec to recognize upcoming people uh, who, who we, we believe are likely to have an impact on the internet standards and technologies going forward. 
I'm very pleased to award this uh, from the IRTF. We're very pleased to receive uh, the support from the Internet Society, from Comcast and NBC Universal uh, to make this possible. Very pleased to announce that we'll be making two ANRP awards tomorrow. Um, the first of which will go to Simon Scherer uh, for his work on modeling the BBR congestion control algorithm, uh, which is a, a paper from uh, the IMC conference last year. Uh, the second will go to Shiva Kakala for his work on automatically verifying the correctness of name server implementations. Really fantastic talks, uh, I expect, really interesting papers. Uh, you can find the papers and the slides up on the website already. Please do come along to the IRTF open meeting tomorrow um, to, to see those talks. And if you can't make it, uh, the recordings will also be on YouTube. In addition, uh, we also run the Applied Networking Research Workshop. Um, this is an annual event which we run uh, co-locating with the July uh, IETF meeting every year, um, organized in cooperation with uh, ACM SIGCOM. Um, this took place Monday this year, uh, 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 Monday this week this year. Very pleased to uh, um, say we got a fantastic program of talks, fantastic program of papers, uh, really nice panel discussion, really nice keynotes. My very much thanks to uh, Francis Yan from Microsoft, Maria Apostolaki from Princeton for, for organizing the workshop this year. Uh, thank you to all the reviewers, the authors, and the speakers. Thank you also to the, the travel grant sponsors, Akamai, Comcast, and Netflix. Uh, we were able to bring a, a significant number of people to the workshop uh, due to their, their very generous travel support this year. And again, if, if you missed the workshop, uh, and I know there was pretty good attendance, um, the, the papers and, uh, are all, all online, linked from the, the URL on the slide, and the talks are all up on YouTube. I'm also pleased to announce that the Applied Networking Research Workshop 2024 will take place um, this time next year. Uh, at the I think it's the Vancouver ITF meeting next year. Uh, the organizers will be uh, Simone Fellin from Red Hat, uh, Ignacio Castro from Queen Mary University of London. Uh, nothing on the website yet, but do look out at the URL there in the next uh, few weeks uh, for details of that workshop. And with that, uh, I think I'm done. Thank you. Next up, we have Martin Thompson, who is the NOMCOM chair for this uh, cycle. Yeah, fear me. Um, next slide, where we are. So um, the role of the NOMCOM is somewhat important in this organization. Uh, we're responsible for selecting leadership, all the fine folks you've seen up here today, and many more who you will see later. This year we have the usual number of IAB members up for uh, reappointment. Two art uh, area directors in the usual slate. So um, expect to see an announcement within the next few days or weeks uh, that outline um, how you can nominate people for these positions. And I encourage you to find as many people as you can to nominate and also encourage them to accept that nomination, please. As of this morning, we have uh, seated the non-com. Uh, after some uh, multiple rounds of selections, we have uh, everyone has managed to confirm the, their availability. And so you can see those people listed on the slide there. If you have any information that you would like to share with the non-com, you can share it with me or any of the people that are on this uh, screen. The people on the right will be the ones that are making decisions uh, about who uh, gets to, to be nominated. To give you a rough idea of where we expect things to be going in the next little while, uh, the non-com seated literally today. Um, and between now and the next ITF meeting, we expect to do most of the bulk of the work that you expect of the non-com, which will be asking for people uh, to volunteer for the positions that we're looking to fill, uh, asking those people about themselves and learning more about them through your feedback and interviews. And uh, we hope to be able to uh, send uh, our nominations to the confirming bodies 
sometime around the end of the year. Um, and ultimately the people will form part of those bodies uh, and be seated at the March ITF next year. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. While Martin makes his way off the stage, can I ask those of you who are on the Nomcom to stand up so the community can take a look and identify you as people? Thank you. Okay, this brings us to the LLC part of the um, plenary. Uh, Jay is here in person. Uh, Jason is online for his section as chair. Thank you. Um, as uh, someone who currently lives in the UK, I can say without a trace of sarcasm how pleasant it is to be in such a warm and sunny city. Um, so, welcome to um, ITF 117. And starting off with our wonderful host, Nokia, who as well as being the host also um, sponsored the fantastic welcome reception last night. Um, thank you very much, Nokia. Um, we're we're going to obviously set expectations now about all other welcome receptions um, that they need to have be as good as last night, and um, hopefully all of the global hosts will rise to that and they'll get better each time, really, so that'd be good. Um, we are doing very well now with our um, set of gold sponsors. So we um, have these, four, these three categories, diversity and inclusion, um, running code and gold sustainability. Um, and we have some committed companies now who are really very much supporting us here. So thank you very much to these four companies for their support. Um, we um, obviously um, very keen to take people's money. So we have lots of different categories here as well. Um, we, we're not going to go as far as the others and have every little thing branded, don't worry. Um, this, is, uh, this is probably the set that we're going to work with. But um, So we have our silver sponsors um, and we have some bronze sponsors. So we, we really got... Um, the one thing we'll notice later is that this is a relatively narrow set of industries and we'll talk about it. But from that set of industries, we have some very committed people. So thank you very much also to our silver and bronze sponsors. Um, now, we've been poor at recognizing this in the past. We have a number of companies that um, sponsor us in, um, with donations of equipment, services, connectivity, food, various other things. Um, and so, for example, I'm just going to call out Calas on this. So they have, for many years, donated to us a, a lovely piece of PDF server software that is used by the RPC to generate the PDFs and things. And it's, um, it's uh, you know, several thousand dollars a year, but they've been doing it for many years and not asking anything, giving us full support. So these companies here um, really do deserve some thanks because they're donating directly to the IETF for our support. Thank you. Um, now, uh, this organization, this meeting would not run uh, without the many generous volunteers. Uh, there was a very successful and very well attended code sprint on Saturday. And the NOC, as you can see, has um, uh, increased in size. And the average age, I believe, has finally dropped below 50. So we're doing very well now with that. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone, to um, all of the, the code sprint volunteers, the NOC, and, of course, the NOC organizations who support them coming along. Thank you. Um, the, the, the team, um, as you know, there are a number of people involved in this. So on, we have the Secretariat staff, who are the ones doing the, the bulk of the hard work running things around. We have the Meteco team, um, who you won't necessarily see so much, but are um, working from early morning right the way through, constantly watching everything and uh, tweaking things as they go through. We have our tools contractors um, uh, who work in the background of things, and we have our NOC contractors who are the ones that have to climb up, fit the things, make sure a lot of the wireless works and all of that kind of stuff and get things to on site and stuff. So thank you very much to all of these people here. Um, 
Um, this is the uh, IETF administration LC. This is our staff. Um, since the last time we presented, we have two new members of staff. So we have Jennifer Richards, who's a senior developer. Jennifer's been working for us as a contractor for a number of years and is now working for us directly. And we have Debbie Sasso, who's, doing our, who's our director of finance, to ensure that we keep our finances going. Um, obviously, some of you are going to suggest that um, you know, we're now building an empire. An empire is like 500 people. Don't worry. This is really not very... Okay, so thank you very much to all of the staff, even though I'm on that slide. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, thank you to our global hosts. These are the ones that um, donate to us every year. They sign um, multi-year multi contracts, and that gives us a lot of the financial stability and the industry support that we need in order to, um, uh, to, to operate and also give us a... Um, a good way to be able to talk to other organizations by de these organizations demonstrating their support. So thank you very much. <laughs> right, so um, IETF 118 later this year will be in Prague. Um, this is the last time we're going to go to Prague for some time. Um, uh, it's got too expensive for us, I suspect, for us to go you know, some more years into the future. So I expect all of you there, everybody who's ever been to Prague to come along, everybody who's ever been to an ITF meeting, okay? Ideally, if we get about 3,000, that should help cover the, you know, the bills that we've had over the last few years with our other meetings. So that'd be fantastic if you'd all come along. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to talk about ITF 119. Now, I, sorry to disappoint Lars, but we're not going to have a spring meeting next year. No, instead, we're going to have two summer meetings because we are going to Brisbane in Australia for ITF 119. Um, and we are uh, obviously very interested in host and sponsor opportunities, both for ITF 118 and ITF 119. Um, Sorry this has taken so long. Um, IETF 119 will be in a conference centre, and conference centres are just the most difficult people in the world to negotiate with. Um, we have to make a trade-off of um, ensuring that we can go to sufficient cities and different cities, and so in order to do that, sometimes that means dealing with the devil. Um, so that's any way forward. But this should be a great meeting. We have finally got everything sorted. So um, look forward to seeing you all there. Right, this is our list of upcoming meetings. Um, the one thing you will notice is that the host column looks a little bit stark here. Um, we are, um, as you know, I think the industry is going through a bit of a, a difficult patch in some places. We are relatively strongly exposed to a small number of industries. And um, so... Uh, we are trying to expand our set of global hosts as well to go beyond our ordinary industry so that we can um, uh, weather some storms a little bit better. But um, at least two of these are under discussion with um, people, so hopefully this will be filled um, not too far off into the distant future. For IETF 114, <clears throat> um, we are looking at North, uh, North America. We have heard your concerns about visas and problems about entering the US. Um, we are looking at the US, we are also looking at Canada, and we have looked at Mexico as well. Um, it is, th those, that work is still ongoing anyway. So we will see where we end up with that. Um, for ITF125 in Asia, we recently did a uh, consultation on a number of cities that we might possibly consider going to. Um, Shenzhen, Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, and Istanbul. Um, the ITF board is still considering um, that, and at some point we'll um, uh, give, make an announcement about how we intend to go a bit for, further with that one. Uh, so that's a pretty good stack of things now. Um, we have some, I think, organized beyond that as well, but we've largely caught up from the COVID issues. Um, the, the rescheduled meetings are all now going to work their way through, and so we can get back to a normal planning cycle for ITF meetings. Okay, um, one of the uh, goals that we have is long-term financial stability, sustainability. And the main way we wish to do that is by growing the IETF endowment. Uh, we have a goal of 50 million uh, by 2027, and currently we're at about 4 million. We have some donors that are giving uh, 
large sums to us. So Aaron have given a large sum to us. The Internet Society, of course, gives us a, a very large amount each year. And RIPE NCC are giving us a large donation spread over a number of years. Um, this year we've had LACNIC um, give us uh, a donation, and or, or last year possibly, and each of these donations is matched by the Internet Society. So that's a, a building, you know, a healthy endowment. Um, uh, obviously, we're still 46 million short, so we do need a little bit more money, um, and we do have a number of ways forward on that. Uh, AFNIC, the, um, uh, the CCTLD for France, has recently pledged 20,000 euros to the endowment. Um, Comcast has pledged $10,000 to the endowment, and we've raised um, uh, just $4,000 from individuals. Um, we're going to be doing some more things as well that um, help individuals um, consider um, supporting us as well. So um, thank you to all of those people, and that's um, how we're growing our endowment. Now, one of the things that we've discussed before is trying to move uh, towards um, net zero ITF operations. Um, and we've had a project that's been going for a little while um, to build a, a calculator that works for us. And we've now done some calculations using that for ITF 116. And we are um, considering the options for um, offsets of our carbon emissions or our equivalents of carbon emissions. Um, we very much recognize that this is a technical organization and that if we went and bought financial credit somewhere and all that kind of stuff, then, you know, I would never hear the end of it. So um, we are looking at, you know, more technical based projects and those type of things that how we can do this more direct things. If any of you have any ideas or if any of you in your organizations have experts on these type of things, we would love to talk to them and hear about those things to understand how we can do that. There is a side meeting on Thursday at 8.30 um, where we want to talk about this more if anyone's free to come along. Okay, that's it from me. And over to Jason Livingood, um, the board chair. Great, thanks very much. Um, I wish I could be there in person, but I am very busy doing some technical trials right now. And uh, so look forward to the next meeting. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You want to do it? <laughs> Sorry, we were Thanks. gossiping. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, no changes here on the uh, on the, the board members. Um, these remain the same. Next slide. So current work, um, really three key areas. Um, we held in June, uh, early June, a strategic planning retreat. We do this annually really just to refresh, um, you know, key risks to the organization, review um, work that's been completed and our priorities for the coming year. Um, and out of that, the two areas of focus that we remain um, uh, sort of, you know, keeping on the radar, one is financial focus. We've made progress there, obviously with Debbie joining um, the team. The objective there is not just fundraising progress, but also the timeliness and accuracy of financial statements. Um, and pleased to see that we're making some strides there. So that's important from our standpoint on the board. And then the final item is that as we looked through when certain board terms were ending, um, it became apparent that we may have uh, sort of a, a, a healthy number run, rolling off at the same time. And so we're, we're studying that to make sure that we have the, the sort of timings correct. And if we do, then trying to come up with some alternatives so that we don't lose a uh, significant chunk of the board all at one time um, because that would be disruptive for the organization. So more to come at the next meeting right there, I think. Next slide, please, Jay. Uh, these are the upcoming board meetings. We always encourage people to come and it's a rare thing when people actually do, uh, but please do join. Um, these are always open and the majority of the agenda time is open. Next one. Uh, this is the current snapshot of the fiscal year operating budget. Um, at the bottom, you know, most of this change is a slight reversal of the investment returns just based on market conditions because we're not, you know, really pulling any of that funding out of our investments. Um, you know, this isn't that important just in the same way that the losses last year when the market was down we're not important because we're not actively you know, selling those things. We're just adding to our investments. 
Um, and you can take a look here at the revenues and expenses. And uh, this is as, as of April, so it's a, a, you know just after the last meeting. You'll see this catch up and become a little bit more current um, over the next couple of months. Um, and you know, just one note here. You know, I think Jay, you mentioned this earlier, and certainly Lars did when he reviewed a list of, uh, of registrations by meeting. Um, that remains challenging for us um, to uh, forecast revenue around meetings because the uh, registrations are, are fluctuating, and uh, you know, it's not apparent that we have a, a stable new pattern just yet. Next slide. And of course, these are all of the many ways that you can contact us. Feel free to reach out if you like. Next slide. And that's it for us. I think now we're on to Glendine for the uh, trust. Thanks, Jason Jay. Glenn, you're up for the trust. Hi everybody, I'm Glenn Dean and I'm the chair of the ITF Trust. Uh, these are, there's five trustees. Uh, these are the, the five that are currently serving. Uh, I'm not gonna read out their names. They're awesome people though. <laughs> uh, the purpose of the ITF Trust for those who aren't familiar with us, we're somewhat unseen typically. Uh, we have the joyful duty, uh, the fun duty of enforcing trademarks and holding the copyrights on all the materials like the RFCs. So we do the IP, uh, the intellectual property part of the ITF um, to the other IP <laughs> that we all work on. Uh, we're also pretty boring. And if we're ever exciting, uh, we're not doing our job properly. So uh, the two big updates are that we have um, issued, uh, we worked with two parties uh, since our last time together. Uh, which were infringing upon the ITF logo. We talked to them very nicely. They talked back to us very nicely. They said, sorry, we'll stop doing that. And we didn't have to get any lawyers involved. It was a very successful and very cooperative engagement. But we did enforce it on two parties. Uh, and the other thing we're doing is we're restructuring, for those who aren't aware, we are restructuring the trust from a uh, Virginia trust into a uh, Delaware not-for-profit corporation. Uh, we've created the corporation back in December, and we are going through the process right now with the IRS to get declared the 501c3 nonprofit status. And once that's been uh, granted by the IRS, we'll actually begin the nasty work of actually transferring all the licenses and assets we own uh, over into the new entity. And so all those other gray boxes will hopefully start becoming green. <laughs> We have office hours tomorrow if you want to come talk to us. Uh, we did this in Yokohama as well. Uh, please come talk to us. You know, it's, I know it's in the morning. You have to get up early on, a, on the last day of the week, uh, and we're all tired, but we would like to see uh, people come on and say hello. Anyways, it's going to be content till 7 around the corner and 9.30 to 10 a.m. tomorrow. And finally, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, here's our email addresses. Uh, we also have a website. You can just get us off the trustee website or this. And that's it. Thanks. Hang on one sec. Um, there, there's Martin Thompson in the queue. Um, we don't typically do open mic for the uh, trust because they're very boring usually. But since everybody's been very good and sticking on time, Martin, if this, you have a question, I'm willing to Thanks. give Thanks that to you. Um, I have a request for the trust. Currently, the ITF uh, license for RFCs uh, forbids the creation of uh, derivative works outside of the ITF, uh, which would uh, make forks of any of the documents produced here uh, impossible under those terms. I would like to request that the trust consider loosening those terms to enable the generation of forks of the work that we do here. We'll think about it. Um, it's, it's, that's a very complex issue. Um, I will point out you can reproduce RFCs in their entirety uh, that's a granted license that everyone has. And of course, you can use them in your work. Uh, but to create a derivative work outside the ITF gets into some interesting issues with um, potentially enabling other SDOs to use our work without our permission. And that does uh, create some issues. I, I think we would need a larger 
consultation, then just the trustees themselves would have to be involved in that. Certainly the ISG, the IAB, and the whole community. It sounds like you've got a, got a fairly good grasp of the sort of things that need to, be, need to happen. I'd, I'd like to request that you, you do that. Thank okay. you. Um, do you we, we are trying to be boring, and that's going to make us very not boring. <laughs> so <laughs> that's undermining the goals. <laughs> All right, uh, next up we have uh, Warren Kumari, who is uh, wearing the knock hat here, I think. So I want to make sure that we have time for open mic, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. So this is a proposal from the IETF NOC, which we've discussed with the IESG and LC, and we wanted to get community feedback. So. Basically, what we would like to do is we would like to move from using 802.1x to using WPA. And a note, when I'm saying 802.1x, I'm actually meaning you know, WPA to enterprise with radius. And when I'm saying WPA, I'm meaning WPA2 and WPA3. So what is the plan? It's largely this. We turn off 802.1x and we turn on WPA. And why do we want to do this? Well, largely it's to make the user experience better. Um, currently, when you connect to the IETF network, you're connecting to an SSID called IETF, but 802.1x uses certificates, and so you get this certificate, and because you can't get a certificate for an SSID, the certificate is actually for services.meeting.ietf.org, and there's no real reason why your machine should trust that. Um, so what we had been doing is we were taking the certificate and we were publishing it on the service called 802.1xconfig.org. And the theory was people could install an app on their phone before they came to the meeting and download the certificate and put it in their certificate store. But as far as we could tell, nobody ever really used that and the service went away. So another thing we tried is we tried publishing the certificate fingerprints online and we would put them on the meeting page and we would email them out. And as far as we can tell, nobody was checking those either. And the reason for that is for at least one meeting, and I believe a couple of meetings, the certificate fingerprints were just wrong. We updated the meeting number, we forgot to update the fingerprint. Nobody ever came along and told us, oi, your certificate fingerprint's wrong. You're not checking them. Um, also, increasingly, people have managed laptops and managed phones like corporate managed devices, and they just don't have the authority to install certs. Um, this means that you know people can't use 802.1x, and certain operating systems make it fairly tricky to try and configure this at all. So we're trying to make it easier for users. You know, we usually have two or three tickets per day related to I can't join the IATF network. Um, obviously, more towards the beginning of the meeting, but throughout. As an example, for Android, you have to configure you know, the security type and the EAT method and the phase two authentication and tell it to your system certificates and not to verify them and then enter this long domain. That's just too hard. So if this is such a bad idea, why did we start doing it at all? Well, when we launched 802.1x, or I guess when we started doing 802.1x in the meeting network, it was in the days of WEP. We have now gone through moving from DEP WEP to WPA, WPA to WPA2. There is now WPA3. And we believe that WPA3 is super good enough and that WPA2 is more than good enough. Um, also, over the past five or six years, there's been a huge increase for people moving to encrypted layer three protocols, right? Everybody's running TLS. Uh, Let's Encrypt has made a huge difference with that. We also have things like, you know, Doe and Dot and those sorts of things. And so we believe that even if somebody was able to decrypt the um, wireless network, you know, there's other layers that are still encrypting the important parts of the data. When we started this as well, we were concerned about the evil twin attack, somebody coming along and standing up a fake version of the IETF network. Seeing as people aren't trusting the certificate, we don't think that .1x is really protecting us from that. If somebody started up a fake, fake IETF and provided a fake cert, people would just click through it anyway. Um, we also had this idea that we could use 802.1x's ability to put people into different VLANs. 
sort of idea that you could join a single SSID and instead of logging in as IETF, IETF, you could log in as, for example, NAT64, with the password of NAT64, and we'd put you in NAT64. We never did that. Seems like it's not a feature that we necessarily need. A couple of frequently asked questions. Um, if we're just doing WPA2 and we use a single pre-shared key, probably IETF, IETF is like the pre-shared key. Doesn't that mean anybody can just decrypt all the traffic? Nope. Um, the pre-shared key is used to derive a um, pairwise transport key. So same like with radius, you know, you don't use that to encrypt, you just use it to derive a key. Um, also, why aren't we just going to do WPA3? It's the new hotness. Yes, it is the new hotness. Um, unfortunately, we tested this in the NOC and we were just made to discover some of our dice devices don't actually do WPA3 yet. All of the APs and radios and stuff do, but you know, some of our phones and laptops don't. So the actual plan is WPA3 with a fallback to WPA2. So if your device does WPA3, you'll use that. If it's not new enough, you won't. Um, so basically, we think 802.1x is more faff than it's worth, and we'd like the community feedback. Not now, though, because of time. So we'll send out email to IETF announce and attendees, I think was the list we decided, and please provide feedback there. But basically, we think you know replacing .1x with WPA will make everyone's life better. And I did that in time. Thanks, Warren. So I actually want to uh, recommend we use admin discuss for this because it's uh, ITF announced nobody else can post to. I can, but but nobody else can. Um, and uh, the attendees list also not everybody might be on it because it's per meeting. So admin discuss would be my suggestion. I get two thumbs up from Warren, which doesn't happen very often. So excellent. Um, <laughs> Right, uh, this brings us to a slightly sadder part of the plenary because we've uh, had uh, some key ITF participants uh, pass away recently. Um, and we have uh, two people who knew them well uh, that are going to say a few words about them. I think, Barry, you're first. So, do we have slides for the two people? Go the oh, I go next. Slide slide. Oh, there it is. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Barry Leva, and I'm the say a few words about John Leslie. <clears throat> John was a physicist by training, actually, back in the day when um, that's what you had to do um, to get a computer science degree, because there weren't computer science degrees. But he wound up being a, a programmer and got involved in the IETF and did work in various areas of the IETF. I knew him when both of us were volunteering to be scribes for the IESG before the secretariat took over that function. and. The, the minutes of the IESG meetings were just pretty, we talked about this and the document remains under consideration by the IESG. And the scribes took down what the gist of the conversation was and provided a level of openness to the community of what happened in the IESG so that you could really see what, what conversations were going on and what we said about your documents and stuff. And that, um, John was very passionate about having that openness and making sure that the community knew what was going on. And he set up a whole bunch of templates and procedures for the scribes to use. And we had a great time scribing for this. And um, it was an interesting experience. And um, John is not with us anymore. And I'm sad about that. So this morning in BMWG, uh, BMWG is the working group that I chaired with Al. I was there for 10 years with him. He chaired it for 10 years before me. Um, <clears throat> as a product manager, we, we do speeds and feeds and, and data sheets. And so I, I gave a bit of a, a data sheet on Al and started off with his firsts, where his first published RFC was in 2002. Uh, that was six years before I came to the IETF. He had a 20 year uh, career um, generating 42 RFCs and 56 drafts. And it's a wonderful thing to say, but <clears throat> I wanted to tell you a quick story about my first, <clears throat> my first IETF, uh, my very first meeting of that Monday was in a, a working group that will remain nameless. So in a room a little smaller than this, lots of mic lines and it ended 
uh, with two folks on either side of the room screaming at each other. And I thought, oh, well, okay. In my next meeting, uh, I walked into BMW G for the first time, and there's Al sitting at the, the chair desk, smiling at us, all welcome, welcome. Uh, and then the meeting starts, and he kicks it off, and he says, welcome to BMW G, the, the kinder, gentler side of the IETF. And I felt like he was talking to my soul. <laughs> was he in the room with me that day? I don't know. Well, actually, I do know. I, I, at the time, I thought, hmm. But since then, I've learned that every BMW G meeting we had, Al would introduce the working group with some variant of that story. And I think it's a very apropos telling of who the man was, right? He was incredibly smart. Uh, in researching the data sheet for, for Al this morning, I found, oh my goodness, he wrote the TWAM specification. I had no clue. Uh, he knew a lot of folks that I've worked with professionally. Um, if you read here, this is an obituary that was provided by his wife. He had a twin brother, and I have to say I'm really sad that given some of the ADs that we've had over the years, Joel, Warren, um, particularly Warren, you, you just saw his update uh, for the knock, I'm really, really sad that I never got the chance to give up my chair just for a day, just for one meeting, and have all of the participants, including the ADs, walk in and see two owls. I, that would have been an epic troll. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what I've learned this week is that Scott Bradner joined us this morning. Joel said some words in, in, as well. And Al was just a kind, A-plus human being, super smart, very approachable, kind and gentle. I don't think those things just apply to the BMWG, which it does. By the way, come visit us. Uh, but it applied to Al. That's who he was. He was very intelligent and caring and giving to the folks around him. And BMWG has a lot of newcomers and first timers like me as well when I was. Uh, and he made that first experience of writing my first draft and, and getting my first RFC in BMWG. He just made that a wonderful experience. So <clears throat> it's a sad day, but I hope uh, when you leave, if you walk into another working group at a future IETF meeting, some working group chair there will say, hey, welcome to the kinder gentler side of the IETF, you'll think of Al. Thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna ask for a moment of silence for uh, the two deceased. Thank you. And with that, um, we are starting the open mics. Um, first up is the ISG, if you would uh, make your way up here. And those of you who um, have questions for the ISG can already sort of uh, get in the queue. Um, this is us. Um, we are uh, all here, Modulo Francesca, who is still on um, maternity leave, and uh, she keeps us updated with uh, cute pictures occasionally that are, that are very nice. Um, and Zahed was here in the beginning of the week, but he had to travel back urgently to Sweden because of a family emergency, so he's not with us. And uh, the queue is open. Introductions, yes, thank you, Miria. Uh, let's start on uh, the far end with Rob. Uh, so Rob, Wil Rob Wilton, and I'm the Ops Management AD. John Scudder, Routing Area Director. Roman Dinelio, Security. Uh, Jim Guichard, Routing ID. Paul Vautas, Security. Eric Klein, Internet. Warren Kamari, Ops ID. Lars Eckert, ITF Chair and Gen. Eric Wink, Inter Andrew Alston, Routing Area Director. Mia Kulevin, IAB Chair. Mari Kucharavi, Art. All right, but now the queues are open. This looks good. <laughs> this looks tough great. crowd, tough crowd. Mr. Clenson is in the queue. Please go ahead, John.
Do I need to do anything? Grant screen, maybe? No? OK. I need to unmute him? No. No, he needs to unmute himself. OK. So I don't do any of this. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> completely clueless when it comes to me, that goes. So John, I, I, I hear there might be something you need to do at your end. Oh. Um, are you there? <laughs> Do, do okay, great. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the appeal that you're processing. I uh, raised an issue on the list that uh, uh, there's some other issues which were not raised in the appeal, but apply to the same document set. Are you going to look at those or do we wait until you process the current appeal and then generate a separate appeal about those issues? So, um, the appeal was about the ISG statement on uh, interim and uh, in-person meetings. So they were not on a document set. So, so you're referring to your email on the NFS V4 documents or? No, what, no, I'm referring to my email on the, the guidance and interim meetings. Okay, so it was, I was under the impression that Zahed had talked to you um, on the phone um, a few days ago. And when I talked to him, he- Sorry, we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're getting confused. Uh, he, okay. he did. He had a very good conversation. I think that's under control at least as soon as he finishes with his family emergency. But after you posted the note about this specific appeal on the guidance document, guidelines document, I posted a note which indicated that there were some other issues which the original appeal did not mention and suggested that when you look at the appeal that you've got in front of you, and that you mentioned earlier that you look at those additional issues also, so we didn't end up having to generate a separate appeal on the additional issues. And I'm wondering okay. where that's going. Got you. So, so um, there was probably a miscommunication because I was under the impression that I had, had discussed that one with you as well. And I, I guess he didn't. Um, so I, I have uh, not prepared uh, anything yet because that came in uh, rather late while we were all in, in the preparation of the meeting. Um, if I remember correctly, and then maybe somebody else can, can correct me on this. Um, you were raising a question, what kind of approval in a virtual interim meeting is seeing by the ISU or the responsible air director? And then there was a second question on um, both in-person and hybrid meetings that I can't recall. But it's the first one, correct. So um, as far as I know, and again, people need to um, correct me on this because Jen doesn't really get interim requests. Um, during COVID, um, when we were fully remote, the ISG at the time uh, delegated the approval of fully online um, interim meetings to the secretariat because there was just a flood of them and it was clear that they needed approval. And that seems to have worked well because we never had any complaints about them. And that is still the process that is being used today because the ISG, believe it or not, occasionally does try to delegate responsibilities. Um, <laughs> On the, on the second part, can you remind me what the question in the email was? I'm sorry. Um, if, <clears throat> if, if, let, let, let's save time. If you don't remember, let me drop you in the ISC another note and we can okay. deal with it on list or whatever it takes. I, I just don't want this to get lost and I don't want to, I want to accidentally back ourselves into a corner where another appeal is needed about the same sets of policies right after you finish processing an appeal. Okay, th thank you, John. I, I, uh, I'm sorry there was a miscommunication. I have Robert who might have a tools correction on this or why are you in the queue because you're in the queue and I can't just, are you in the no, queue? No, I'm because... in the queue. Okay, got it, sorry. All right, um, thank you, John. We'll get back to you on that. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks. I have Alan next. Yes, this is Alan. Um, this is just a quick comment on Warren's con. Can you get Warren... close to the mic? It's hard to hear. It's short, yeah. This is just a quick comment on Lauren's comment earlier about WPA2 and WPA3. Yes. Um, the issue with 802.1x is the technologies are okay. The user interfaces are not handled by the IETF and they're somewhat worse. So it, it's fine, it's a good idea. I couldn't get on earlier, so. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I plus one on moving to WPA. Um, Tim. 
Uh, hi there, uh, Tim Chang. I notice we have now sponsors for diversity inclusion. As a 50 something year old white bloke, I'm looking at a row of 50 something year old white blokes largely. Um, what are we doing about diversity inclusion with the people that are sat either side of you? So I would hold that for the LLC, which, which oversees this. I, I would point out that none of that money actually goes to leadership, right? This is all going to programs such as the childcare and various other um, mechanisms that let people attend, like fee waivers and so on. Okay. The question still stands. The question is also of sponsors. Uh, what are we doing about it? Well, apparently, it's also a question for the nomcom. But I mean, the, the, the let me sort of. I, I used to be a nomcom a while ago, right? And, and the nomcom is um, obviously limited by the candidates that accept nominations for certain roles, right? The nomcom can't pick people that that didn't volunteer. And so Martin already said earlier, right, that, that he hopes that lots of people get nominated and he also hopes that lots of people then accept that nomination. And if you want to see diversity, that's where it will need to come from because the ISG and the IB and various other leadership models have very little ability to appoint people ourselves, right? So it's, it's really the community that needs to make sure that it um, reflects the diversity it wants to see in leadership by nominating people and convincing them and their employers that it's worthwhile. Any more, uh, Andrew? Yeah, um, so I think this is actually a really important point. A lot of it comes down to where can we get people who actually want to stand up and run? Um, for myself, I, I speak as the first African resident to actually sit on the IESG. And a lot of that I found came from the fact that the NOMCOM was actually asking a lot of diversity questions. And we are out there, I know for myself, out there trying to bring people from, you know, my continent here, try and increase the diversity. Because as you say, I'm, you know, in Africa, we would refer to me as a pale male. Um, I, I would like to see more inclusion, and it is being worked on, but it's about getting the candidates to actually be willing to accept the nominations, to come in here and stand up, and that is part, partly about education, to go out there and say, this is the IETF, come and participate. And it is something that I think that I know from myself and other people here, we are actively trying to encourage people to come and put their names forward and stand up and join the team. Rob and then uh, Roman. So, so I, um, I agree that actually one of the key issues here is trying to get more diversity into the organization in terms of people who are participating because that's where everyone gets pulled into. The one action or one of the actions I think that ADs can take and working group chairs can take is to try and help promote more diversity through the position. So that might be like a working group secretary position or uh, if you're choosing like a new working group chair, you have that choice of who you're choosing between and, might, and you may choose to put forward a, a candidate that uh, you think that might sort of increase the diversity. So there's that sort of option and choice that um, I've chosen to exercise and things uh, in at least one occasion because I think that helps. And I think that's the way it has to change, but it still doesn't fundamentally change the aspect we need to get more diversity of people coming into the organization, which really requires uh, the outreach to companies and other organizations to sort of encourage them to get more diverse in terms of who they send. I wanted to build on what Rob I wanted to build on what Rob said. Uh, certainly there's, uh, th there's the considerations from the NOMCOM, but uh, as ADs, one of the biggest levers we have is thinking about how does one get from, uh, from being a participant in the community to being an AD. And one of those key things is providing other leadership opportunities, the biggest of which is working group chairs. I think almost everyone here sitting at the table was prior a working group chair. And I know uh, I and my, my fellow ISG, uh, ADs uh, consider that uh, consider that in in the selection of those working group chairs to give folks that ha haven't prior had those opportunities uh, and bring them into that leadership fold because that's one of the key stepping stones to ultimately end up on on this board or kind of any of the others here uh, in IETF leadership. Last. Okay. Um, did so yeah, also. following on from what <laughs> Rob and Roman said, um, you can get close to the mic. I think. Yeah. 
So yeah, looking up here, you know, it is a bunch of old white guys. But from up here, looking at the audience, there's a large bunch of sort of old white guys as well. Um, <laughs> what might be really helpful is speak to your colleagues and try and convince more people to come along and participate so that, you know, our entire community is less made up of old white guys. That would be really helpful. Yeah, in the same way, I, um, it, the important part is really to, to increase diversity of this whole community. And that's something that the IAB and the ISG has to discussed a lot. But I also have to say, just throwing money at the problem doesn't only help it, right? Um, as Warren just said, we get, we get this diversity money from companies, but then the companies are just sending us the same people. So, and we depend on who's sent here. So you I, all can do a lot there. Um, but then at the same time, also, if you have ideas about additional things we can do, please let us know, because that's really something that we've been discussing very intensively lately. Um, Harold and Robert have been in, in the queue for a while, but some other people joined. I wanna ask if anybody uh, else is in the queue that wants to talk about diversity. So Michael, Andrew, or Leslie? Leslie, yes. Leslie wants to. Okay, Leslie, please go ahead so that we don't have to skip around topics, if you don't mind. Oh. Sure, thanks. Leslie Daigle. Um, I think maybe Tim didn't ask the question quite right, because I don't think it was a question of why are you all up there at the table? I think everybody's doing a fine job. However, comma, I think the question is, why does that table ultimately not look like this audience does? There are more women and uh, other underrepresented people in this audience than there are at that table. So the question about programs may be more about how do you make sure that people who are here are given the same opportunities as everybody who up, is up there has had. And I'm not saying I'm looking for opportunities. Uh, I've had plenty, thanks. Um, but so it is possible, um, but maybe, maybe you need to focus a little harder on making sure that um, that you're not just stopping at throwing money at the problem, as Miria said, and focus on making sure everybody gets the opportunities. Fair point. Uh, one, one suggestion off the top of my head would be to, to see if we can have a, I don't want to call it a buff, but at least sort of community meeting on this where we could discuss this a little bit longer than we have at the plenary. Um, Robert, do you want to go next? Or Andrew, were you also in the topic or? Okay, all right. I want to take Andrew and then we're going to go back to the queue. Um, uh, yeah, so just a, a couple of things. There's a comment, uh, I think Carol made it in, in the uh, chat, that we get a lot of people coming to a meeting once and they're never seen again. Um, and also the point I was going to make anyway is uh, Corinne Kath Speth, um, her PhD thesis was on the culture largely of the ITF. It makes some of it's uncomfortable reading, um, but I would urge if you've not read it, please read it. There's a lot of good points and learnings in there. Um, I think there's a lot of resistance in the community to the points that are made, but if you want to change and improve the diversity, then you have to change the culture, um, and, which is always difficult, but that's fundamentally the problem. Um, and as I say, the, the measure of why that's a problem is the, the sheer turnover of people that come once and then are so put off by the culture that they literally never come again. So we have a lot of clues as to what the answers are. It's whether there's an appetite to do something about it in reality. So thank you for bringing this up. This is a really important point. Um, but changing the culture is like <laughs> very, very hard and definitely not something that will happen very fast, right? Something we're trying and you all need to support that. And I just want to say, um, I read these reports and um, they don't offer any kind of advice or whatever, right? So it's like, it's a hard problem. If you have any advice how to improve, I'm, I'm very open to that. Um, I think we have made improvement. That's also something that's not acknowledged in these reports. And the other thing I would like to ask people is to also kind of promote the IETF and the community, because what I also see in these reports is, is kind of rather giving advice to not contribute because the barriers are too high. And that is kind of a little bit counterproductive. So we're really, really trying here and we all need to work together in order to make it work. Because I'm, I'm bad at running queues, it's actually Harold that is next, and <laughs> not Robert. So Harold, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, uh, sorry, not no. Sorry. Thank Please. you. Uh, completely different subjects. 
I was in uh, Gender's match earlier this uh, week, listening to people explaining that they had a problem with uh, ISG's ability to manage a document queue. I had a real problem. I had to check that they were not reading aloud from RFC 3744 published in 2004. The ISG's working methods have been constant for more than 20 years, and this wheel has been squeaking for more than 20 years. Can we ask you, Lars, as the top responsible person for this organization's working methods to take a good look and see that we can do something about it so it doesn't squeak for another 20? You can ask, and I'm going to put it on my long list of things that are already on the plate for the ITF chair. This is one of my pet peeves, right? That there's a ton of RFCs that basically task me or my role with a lot, right? Um, this one, I would actually argue, is, is the responsibility of the entire ISG. I think 2026 doesn't specifically say that the chair needs to do it. However, I'm obviously leading the ISG. Um, so so we, the, there were a bunch of air directors in the Gen Dispatch meeting, right? And we followed the discussion with interest. And I think the, so there were some good points that were made. Like the community, I think, needs to come to some consensus on what it thinks the priorities are for the ISG. Because I don't think we have clarity on that. And, and the ISG going ahead and trying to um, change things about the way we process the documents may not actually then lead to a successful you know, improvement. The other thing I will sort of say is that there was a lot of focus on the document queue because that is what everybody understands and it's very visible in the data tracker. For most 80s and specifically for the ITF chair, you have a document queue on one side that you need to manage and, and we have a process that is old and I would say established and everybody kind of understands it. And then you have a game of whack-a-mole on the other side and that one is completely unpredictable and interrupts everything. And you need to keep both of those things in sync. And so it's not only the documents that are causing load on the ISG, it is random other events that somehow end up on the ISG's plate. But I will take an action item to see if we can have a community com discussion, probably in a room at uh, the next ITF of others. Thank you. The problem statements in that RFC are also spread out of a, over a number of ISG issues. The main point is actually that we have had a lot of working group of ITF chairs who have not managed to change fundamentally what, how the ISG operates. And I think it may be time to abandon the status quo. Thanks for your vote of confidence here. Um, <laughs> um, so so it, it is a very hard problem, right? It is, it is because the, the ISG is clocked by the queue and um, there was a discussion whether we could run experiments, right? And um, I think we're actually willing to, to consider that, right? Um, but they need to be well-defined with metrics and, and and data back and so on, but also the community needs to understand um, that while we run experiments, things are gonna be slower, right? Because they're not gonna be faster. Um, do we have any reactions to Harold from the rest of the ISG? Otherwise I can also move along, John. Yeah, I have one reaction, which is, um, so I was at Gen Dispatch also, and um, so, so I agree with you, Harold, um, that um, there's a, a wheel and it's been squeaking and it's been squeaking for 20 years um, or more. Uh, the other thing that I heard at Gen Dispatch, and you know, I'll speak under correction, but was that it was you know a bit like the the parable of the blind people and the elephant and all that, right? Where different people have had their own ideas about what was causing the squeak. Um, so until we have some kind of clarity on, and, and I think that one of the more productive suggestions was let's you know focus on that first um, and, and until the community has some clarity on what exactly should be fixed, we're gonna have a harder time coming up with a fix. Um, so that's, that's my reaction. 
Robert. Yeah, I'm going to pick very gently on your queue management because you correctly recognized when I got up that I was adding to the conversation that John had started. Um, you misspoke slightly, but in an important way. You chose to delegate approval of interims to the chairs. You gated announcement of the inter interims to the secretariat, who are also tasked to make sure that the chairs were reasonably within the bounds of guidance that you gave them when they should approve these things. I think that was the right thing to do. Um, as you're going through the appeals uh, resolution process and choosing to do whatever you're going to do with updating the guidance, please maintain that. This takes work off the aid, workload off of the ISG, puts the responsibility in the right hands. The AD still have the responsibility to steer if the chairs are not doing the right thing. It's been working. Don't change that. Thanks, Robert, and thanks for the clarification. Um, I think we had Leslie already, so Tara is next. Uh, thank you. I'm going to bring it back to the topic of the diversity. Um, yeah, I mean, I do hear, like, for me, like, it's really frustrating when someone brings up a question about funding and the answer is we should do more outreach. I don't think it's a marketing issue. Like, the IETF's, like, value proposition, why people should participate in it is clear. Um, on the other hand, yeah, culture issue is real, and I'm sure that, like, an organization that has so much experience coming up with process and coming up with solutions can come up with a process that looks at culture and come up with solutions. Like, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem for all the smart people here. Um, but yeah, I, I want to bring it back to the funding. My comment on the fact that throwing money at the problem won't solve it is don't knock it till you try it. We have not been anywhere close to throwing enough money at the problem of diversity and inclusion. So my suggestion is like, Please take the original consideration seriously. Try to invest way more resources because I think there's a structural problem where participating in ITF is not easy and it's not cheap. And certain people have more access to resources and I certainly have more ability to participate in such a process. And until either that process changes well enough that it provides an equal access like ground to everyone there's there's an imbalance in resources and that imbalance in resources should be taken seriously and addressed with enough support for folks who might not have yeah, that kind of access. And thank you. Well, thank you for that point. And, and I'm sorry if I if I said something that you interpreted as we shouldn't, you know, spend more money and, and yeah, I, also I'm yeah, I was just I was just saying that in general, like I'm not like I wasn't targeting anyone yeah. with my comment, just I think yeah, it's just I don't think yeah, I mean looking at my, my I'm also like, this is, I only come to a very few ITFs every once in a while, so I might not have the full picture. So I apologize if I'm missing something, but I don't think there's been enough spending on diverse inclusion compared to oh, you, other You're correct. It's a reasonably yeah. new um, sort of category of, of, of sponsorship money that we're getting, and we're actively actually looking for suggestions, what else we could do. I think the childcare, I don't remember. I think it might've come as a suggestion from the community um, and we, you know, established it, we tried it out, it worked well, and we're going to fund it in perpetuity. If there's other things that we can consider spending money on, um, we actually we're in a good situation where actually we have supporters that, that see the value in DNI. And so if we can um, outline a program for them, you know, we're usually able to attract some funding to run it. Um, mm -hmm. But but we were actually very happy to hear if those of you go to other events and see something that works there, you know, let us know. Um, and make suggestions and we can see if we can come up with something else that we can try. No, it's just more funding and hopefully also take that culture issue seriously. I think it's, it's something that can change. Other organizations, other bodies have been able to manage culture and look at it, but it takes one, you need to have a process, you need to have like uncomfortable conversations, you need to have uh, to take a internalized look at what happens within like the different working groups and different modes of operation. Like it's, it's, it's not a problem that's impossible to solve. Like the knowledge, the body of knowledge exists out there. And I think it, it's something that, yeah, IDF can figure out. It's not, but it should be taken seriously and, and put into operation. Thank you. I think Eric, you had a reaction. Yeah, I mean, we obviously agree with you on this one, but sometimes money can help. For instance, for two ITF meetings now, we have the closed caption. 
And as a non-English speaker, sometimes when I'm hearing somebody which is also a non-English speaker, I am looking at those, it helps. They're just one minor thing, but it helps. I would, because I was, so I was saying just throwing money at the problem is not enough, right? So um, more money can help, but at the moment we have actually a budget here and we need more ideas what we can do. And just a very quick comment on the culture. Um, I think there has been a little bit of improvement lately. The one specific challenge we have in this organization is that we are an open organization. We don't have membership or whatever, which makes things slightly more complicated than for other organizations. And again, this is a challenge where we need input and ideas. Yeah, I, I also just don't go ahead. wanted to make one other comment about you know the money issue. If you spend the money, for example, flying 50 people here, that can help bring people in. But then we've got to find a way to keep them coming back. And that, yes, speaks to culture. It speaks to education. It speaks to a lot of things. And I think that more ideas about retention of new people would also be you know very welcome because that is something that i've noticed that a number of people come and they show up here they're here for a meeting or two meetings and then they don't come back and ways to increase that retention of people um, on the newcomer side i think would be a really good thing and i would love to hear ideas from the community about how we can get better at retaining the newcomers. Thank you. I'm going to close the queue um, after I know because we're running uh, quite a bit late, but uh, Q, please go ahead. Uh, Q myself. So I have a few things to say on this. Um, I second, I forget what their name was. I'm so sorry. Uh, it was just speaking comment about spending more money. Um, not the nine, what was it? What, tw right. 18 fee waivers were given out. I don't think that's necessarily enough compared to how many people are present here. The, I, I'm not sure what the financial situation is, but I think that the more could be done to help people who don't have the money come here to come here. Not necessarily to every meeting, just like if we can make someone, if we can make it so someone can, can come once a year, that's still a massive improvement, not three times a year. I know that that can get expensive. Um, I would also suggest more outreach with uh, universities because I'm looking around the room and this is quite an old audience generally. <laughs> so if we could get some more university students in, that would be great. Um, and, you know, fresh ideas, new people, always nice. Uh, and on the topic of retaining people, uh, I think more could be done on, I'm not sure what could be done, but more could be done on the guides system, which I used the, in Yokohama, which was my first meeting, and I generally found it a bit inadequate. I was just being told what was already on the ITF website, more, more hand-holding through the meeting, because it's just such, it's such a massive organization that it's, like, you can read all the RFCs about how the, it operates, but it still doesn't make sense. So a bit more hand-holding through a first meeting would probably help. Thank you. Wes, I guess I'm, I skipped you. I'm sorry. Or the queue's jumping and I'm... Don't worry right. about it because I'm actually going to follow that up. So thank you. That was actually... I came up here to talk about two things, one of which was the guides program. I want to thank all the guides that have participated in the past because that is how we get new people in and make them comfortable. We have talked a lot about how do we improve it? How do we do... One thing that we, we recognized a number of years ago is that we can't handhold people completely through the meeting because there's people that need to do their own work. So we have to find the right balance there. But I do think that we're missing sort of the long-term, how do we get from somebody coming new into the door, trained up to a leadership position? And the, the IESG and the IAB have had conversations in the past about how do we, how do we build that pipeline? How do we get that queue? Um, and the guides program is, is sort of the start of that. To everybody else, it's, you know, be open, welcoming, approachable, and all the types of things that require people to stick around. Um, and then finally, speaking of the age of a lot of the people in this room, I suspect that means that many of us are managers. Um, if, if, you're, if you're 
upwards in your company, you probably have somebody working for you. I know I try to get diverse students, you know, working with me, for example. Um, if you're a manager, you can probably fund people to get here or talk to your organization to make it happen. And that's, you know, you're the ones that are going to be responsible because as Lars stated but much earlier in the day, you can only accept the nominations from the people that you get. So the managers in this room are the ones that will enable people to actually be nominatable, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Wes. Um, Tim. Uh, hi, yes, so Tim Chang, so thank you. I think a lot of the comments that have been made here have been really good. Um, I think there are some sort of fundamental questions that also need to be asked, like who in the IETF is responsible in some way for diversity inclusion? Who could people go to and have a confidential discussion about it, for example? Um, what are we doing to measure and monitor it and report it? Those are the sort of, you know, if you're going to fix something, you need to be able to measure and monitor it. But those are sort of some of the basic questions we need to make sure we've got clear. And I, you know, I agree with the, the point that maybe we need some way of being able to discuss it more. There's a lot of ideas are needed. I do agree that there are things that could be funded, sort of independent, um, what's the word? People speaking independently to some of the attendees that come to find out what their views are and to be able to summary report those and to find out. You know, Warren says, you know, he looks out into the audience and he sees a lot of white 50-year-old um, people like me um, but there are, you know, I've seen around the hall today, there is an awful lot of, for example, attendees from Asia, and I don't see many Asian people up there. Uh, maybe they don't come to the plenary for another reason so much as we do, for example. So there's a whole, it's a very, very it's a very easy question to ask, and it's a very complicated thing to fix. But I think there are some, some of the fundamental things like response, taking responsibility for it, having a person who's at least eight, one person or maybe more whose responsibility it is and getting the measurement and monitoring and reporting in place. Yep. Thanks for that. So I, I will point out that the um, LLC or specifically the, the surveys that the LLC is doing uh, is tracking diversity. You know, it has been tracking it for a number of times and there's actually questions that are specifically about, you know, why do or don't you participate and what are the, the problems we have? And, and you know, one, one data point that I remember because it's, it's very sad is that you know, the tech industry, I think has a 20% ratio of females and we have under 10. So we are like twice as bad as the tech industry, which is already terrible, which is a depressing metric. Um, Tobias, uh, so Max? we got to move on a little bit because we're running kind of late. But... Yeah, so um, Tobias Hibich, Max Planck Institute of Informatics. Uh, I think one point about diversity is what Baron is doing, like somebody has to wear a hat mm -hmm. and uh, be in charge of that. Um, so I do have uh, some thoughts on people that could be approached who I don't want to publicly throw under the bus here. So if there's somebody who can um, think, push about like how we could get somebody in charge of that. And the second thing is just starting to do something. So a first step would maybe be a birds of a feather session or like after this meeting, squatting a room and talking. Last thing I... So, um, I mean, diversity and outreach is many, many aspects, as we discussed already, right, including chairs training, leadership training, new participants and whatever. And we have activity for that. And that's all put together under the EOD and they have a meeting so you can go there. So that's like a good discussion point. And then there's also part of the responsibilities for the um, IAB. Um, we are usually have a lot of outward facing activities uh, where we talk to other organizations or go out into other uh, meetings. So we actually try to coordinate this a little better and create actually a position to have an outreach coordinator. So um, that that is hopefully the touch points if you want to get engaged in that EOD, IAB. But in generally, I also want to um, just encourage you to like contact the leadership, the IHG or the IAB anytime, just send us an email. I mean, like we get a lot of emails, but we don't get a lot of emails from the community about these kind of things. So we will take them seriously. Thank you. Um, Eric, I had closed the queue before you. I'm sorry, but it I know... was there way before you closed the queue. Okay. So maybe there were some Wi-Fi issues. Okay. So I'm going to take Arno first and I'm going to take Eric as the last one to the ISG. Arno, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. So Arno Tadei, Simontek by Broadcom. Uh, so uh, it's more to share uh, perhaps a perspective to perhaps give su suggestions. So I think the problem that we have here is not specific to IETF. 
We see that in other SDOs. I mean, the ITU, we have same issues, diversity, uh, the old white men that are in the rooms, and so on, same issues. But I would like to rebound on VES, because VES made a very good point. Uh, the issue is that it's not only to get people here first, and that's hard. And, and the issue actually has to deal with their managers in their companies. Because when we studied the problem, and, and it went through two resolutions that failed, to an action plan that we managed to establish, we realized the stupid problem we have was a question that came from a former EU commissioner who said, have we checked if in education on leadership trainings, is standardization still uh, uh, explained? And the answer seems to be no. So there is a large part of the world where when engineers come, and it's beyond diversity, when engineers come and try to come, they have to convince their managers who have no idea what standardization means. Large areas on the industry, when you ask the question, what is IETF, they are clueless. Perhaps ISO is good because ISO has its name in their standards, so they did good marketing, but for, for what we are doing, it's strange, but that is what we observe. So we have a bigger problem because to, to get them to agree for their engineers to come here and to sustain this, this is very hard today to convince them what the ROI and so on. Understood. They, do you yeah. have a suggestion for us that, that or have you have an example of what worked for, for those so, organizations? No, the suggestion would be perhaps you could compare notes between, say, ITF, ITU, and so on, because we have maybe things we could bring. We have an action plan we could share. We could show what we are trying to do, and maybe you could join forces on some of the areas there. Thank you. Eric. The mic's not working here. It keeps speaking. It, I guess I need to turn it up. Is this working now? Yeah. Yay. Um, the... I'm wondering if we looked at collecting metrics on why we have one-time attendees, because this is something I've noticed as well. Um, and I agree with Andrew that I think there's an important part of not just getting people to show up, but getting people to show up and keep showing up. And, and we've been actively trying to um, increase the diversity of our attendance, which is also mostly a bunch of middle-aged white guys. And the, one of the things that we run into is that oftentimes we'll have people who will come once and then uh, will not come back again. And like we have anecd I have anecdotal data as to why, but it's something where those anecdotes don't necessarily provide as much information. Whereas if we started looking at, at collecting that every single IETF and look at who came, came and then didn't, didn't come again the next time, that might start giving us some concrete data to start looking at what parts of the culture we might need to fix or, or are there things around um, travel budget that we need to fix or, or are there things around um, training or other things that could help with people feel more comfortable when they come here the first time to keep coming back. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm going to put a pin in this because I think this is now entering LLC territory and, and Jay has been running surveys and, and might actually have data on this. And I think you're on the stage with us later on. Excellent. So then maybe we, we can sort of mm -hmm. take um, a response to Eric then from the LLC because I think this is now straight beyond the, the ISG. Um, thank you all. Thank you, ISG. Next up is the IAB, so Miriam can stay. Uh, rest of the IAB, please uh, come up to the stage. And um, we might run a couple of minutes over depending on how busy the mic lines uh, get. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. Hello again. Just start coming. Introduction. Colin Jennings, board enthusiast. <laughs> uh, Chris Wood, IAB. Tommy Polly, IAB. Drew Todi, IAB. Alberto Rathana, IAB. Ching Wu, IAB. Uh, Colin Perkins, IRTF chair. Wes Herdiker, IAB. Mia Kuhlman, IB Chair. Lars Eckert, IB. But I guess you do. <laughs> 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 but you are, whatever. <laughs> Mallory, Mallory, no. <laughs> Mallory, no, IAB. Tian Hanyao, IAB. Suresh Krishnan, IAB. 
Okay, mic line is open. It's great. All the questions went to the ISG. No problem. <laughs> Works for us. Yeah. Five more seconds. Okay. Next, the LSE. <laughs> so Amy and Cindy, I want the middle slot next time for the ISG again. That works way better for us than, than the first one. <laughs> um, Miriam. I thought for a second we were going for maximum spread here, but I guess not. <laughs> Sure. Um, Sean Turner. Uh, Lars Eckert. Miriam Kühne. Yeah, okay. um, Jay oh. Daly. Shall I kick off Sean with this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm just gonna, Jason uh, Loving Good, remote. Um, there's, not, there's not a video showing of uh, who's on the stage, by the way. Okay, Jason, I'm just going to kick off a little bit with our um, of course, yeah. uh, a brief. Thing about um, diversity and inclusion from the LLC um, perspective. Yep. So first of all, the, the things that we use the, the money on are fee waivers. So we have, um, what, 270 people roughly are coming off the diversity inclusion budget this time. Um, support for the sisters group um, and uh, child care um, and uh, some of the grants um, money that goes towards um, the, uh, the ANRW and other things. Um, so for, from the LLC perspective, there are four things that we can do to support the community and support the IETF here. Um, the first one is measure, second is analyze, the third is create the right conditions, and the fourth is provide support. Um, all of those are things that we're doing at the same time. They're not um, uh, se sequential. So we've been doing a lot of measurement about, what, um, uh, about the, the diversity of the community, um, about um, barriers to participation, and um, trying to get data about that as much as possible. So that's the all of ITF community survey that we do. We've done twice now. Uh, we sent it out to 50,000 people, had 2,000 responses each time, and we have some good data from that. And that's where we get the figures that um, Lars was able to quote earlier. So we're able to scope the problem. That's you know part of it. The next thing is analyzing it. So um, this meeting, we actually have somebody walking around who's doing a series of interviews um, with women about their experiences within the ITF so that we can understand more about that and understand why people come, what they don't come, what those things are. The, the next thing is about creating the conditions for people to be able to come. And that's something that's taking place across the organization. But you will notice that the organization is getting more welcoming, is getting better. So. Um, there are uh, some of that is about the um, uh, just the the action that the ISG and others are taking about some of the behavior and things and some of it is about the fact that many people here are recognizing they have a personal responsibility and they are um, bringing that personal responsibility to the table all the time and then the final thing is the support so that is support in multiple ways we've had a, a major review of the newcomers program and are now doing that very differently and that is now producing great results people are liking it they're coming back again um, we have um, also uh, put considerable work into the documentation and the other things that people are getting which has got more to go and um, then, I mean, well, there are multiple other bits, but that support is being worked on. So we, we've still got a long way to go, um, but we do actually at least have a, a plan and a, uh, for tackling this that goes across the organization. So it's an it's a absolute high priority. We all know that, we all understand that. Um, and um, it, it's something that is being worked on. So that's just quickly it from the LLC perspective and then I'll hand back. All right, I'll run the queue. Uh, Anthony. Yep, uh, Anthony Somerset. Um, I saved this for the LLC because it's LLC and I'm hoping that I sit on the, the right side of old. Um, I was obviously brought by, not quite my manager, but by a work colleague. Uh, I will say it is quite hard to keep coming. Um, just, it's a lot of effort, but you know, pushing through and enjoying it. 
Um, my question being the honorary tenure African in the room coming up from South Africa every time, this is long haul every single IETF. So um, sticking my kind of stake in the ground, have we considered this the IETF an African meeting, even if it's not part of the main rotation? So we are relatively constrained by RFC 8719 about that. Um, it needs somebody from the community to recommend that to the IETF um, mailing list. It needs then a process to be followed um, uh, to see if there's community consensus about that, which Lars judge, um, judges, and then we can start work on that. So um, I, I personally would like to see that change to a very different process, but if we, I can talk to you certainly about initiating that process. Yeah, I was going to ask. Which... It, it, it picks uh, no, it back I up. It's actually gone. Batteries. Um, just tell me which list, and I'll, you know, I can start the process. No problem. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you later on. Explain it. Uh, Leslie. Thank you, uh, Leslie Nagel, and this is for Jay. Uh, I would like to give you an opportunity, Jay. Uh, in your slides earlier, you were talking about uh, you had a chart of upcoming meetings with hosts listed, and there are about eight blanks. You said a couple were under discussion, and there's room for improvement. Um, that sounds kind of like there's a lot of room for hosting opportunities. Um, so I really like you to drive the point home um, to say that we really need hosts to step up for our upcoming meetings and maybe give some indication of what will happen uh, in our budget if we don't get hosts for those meetings. Well, I mean. I know I could start like the great social that everyone loved won't happen, right? Lots of other things of, of that effect happen and it hurts where you want to go, right? So at the end of the day, if somebody wants to go to Africa, right? Somebody's going to have to help probably write a check for that. So you can add more if you like. Um, yes, please do um, step up. Please do help support us. Um, each of the meetings normally, the, the host fee is um, $390,000. It's a lot of money, but it's um, a fraction of the cost of the, the meeting. And um, without it, we can support a number of meetings without it, but it gets more and more difficult. And as Sean says, there are fewer things that we can do. Um, we understand that the industry is going through a bit of a difficult patch, but we think the IETF is still exceptionally valuable. As somebody has pointed out, if the IETF goes, you can't recreate it. It simply wouldn't work again the next time around. So please, yes, do support it. John Levine. Yeah, John Levine. I have sort of a boring question, which is, I noticed on the financial summary that, that the expenses are $300,000 below estimate, which seems like, I understand why the revenue would be off, but I'm kind of wondering where the $300,000 went. Uh, sorry, it is below, yes, I'm not entirely sure. Of the reasons. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll take that back and get back to you. <laughs> it's just, yeah, if, I mean, I'll, look, I'll help you look under the sofa if that, if that yeah, would help. All right, all right. Yeah. Saving money, we're doing good things. Uh, Mr. Nottingham. I think the phrase you're looking for is we'll take that on notice. Yeah. Uh, Mark Nottingham. Uh, when you're talking about diversity, especially in leadership, I would very much encourage you to think big and to think long term. For example, I would love it if in five years we had a non-trivial number of people up on the stage who were supported in their work to make sure that we had a diverse set of people there in many different axes. And by supported, I don't just mean, you know, comping meeting fees and, and, and travel. I mean significant support. So please think big. Yang Kat Yao. Oh, sorry. Hello. <clears throat> So, uh, when I first uh, come ITF, I think it's 2005. The registration fee is uh, around uh, five, 500 uh, US dollar. Now, the registration fee is uh, 1,000 uh, US dollar. So, in future, maybe 2,000 US dollar. So, I think uh, this model may be uh, not uh, sustainable. So, 
I think uh, IETFLC may be uh, need another business opportunity. So, uh, because now ICANN has uh, the new GTLD program, so maybe uh, next, uh, next two years or one year, so they will open. So maybe IETFLC can uh, apply, for example, dot IETF, dot RFC, dot internet, dot draft. So, uh, use the domain name registration fee, so we can, uh, so we can re increase the rev uh, revenue of IETF, so we, uh, so we don't need to uh, uh, increase the registration fee every year. So maybe we should set a bar to the uh, IETF registration fee, because we have, if the registration fee is, is too high, so they, we, will limit the number of attendance. Maybe only the big company can send the people to here, but some self self employed people or uh, small company cannot send the people to ITF. So, uh, so, so that's my so, suggestion. So uh, apply the new, T, uh, new TLD to, from ICANN. So I'll get another TLD. Yeah, yeah, yeah another yeah. TLD. Oh, maybe one. I don't know, but we're definitely looking at the we're looking at all kinds of fundraising. We have somebody whose job is to do that. Um, Lee, Lee Berkeley Shaw over there. Um, we are looking at uh, large organizations that um, have um, you know, the ability to throw off large chunks of change. And my goal is to get like $100 million in the bank. So a lot of stuff is free and we don't have to ask for money. Unfortunately, the part about the registration fees going up from 500 to $1,000 since 2005, we did a consultation like just a couple of meetings ago to actually address that. And the, unfortunately, there's this thing called inflation. It does go up. So you're right. Until we get the revenue stream somehow different and, fit, and, and in a different way, it's going to keep going up. That's just unfortunately how it's going to go because mo their money does not grow on trees. So, uh, well, but again, I, I appreciate I, uh, you're looking. We're looking. If you got ideas, talk. You know, somebody you can write a check. Talk to Lee Berkeley. She's more than willing to take your money. <laughs> so, well, so, I mean, there, there, so, there are obviously strings. We don't just take it from anybody, but you know. Um, so one, one last sentence, because Jay has, I think he has uh, some registration operation experience. So, uh, so I've been member worse also. Yeah, I, I, I can board a member. Mm. So if we apply a new TLD for IETF, so we have opportunity. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Abdu Salam. Yes, uh, I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate the work uh, you're doing. Uh, usually, as uh, Jay said, uh, the survey and analysis uh, is very important. Uh, uh, I, I will ask: uh, uh, Have uh, you done some uh, survey with the management, or? have some uh, questions and answer to analyze what the management think uh, regarding the process or what are the challenges uh, and uh, if they uh, got to their goals or not. You know, usually in uh, administration or in uh, uh, job processes, as you see it as um, uh, not a technology uh, point of view, but it's ad as administrating. Uh, is there quality in the achieving uh, the tasks uh, of the organization? I think this is uh, the job of LCC, maybe. Uh, you should tell me if I'm wrong or not. And also, usually engineers, they are not good, or technical engineers are not good in uh, management. So it's good to have some kind of auditing, uh, another party as you, L uh, LLC. You tell me if I'm... I, I didn't achieve what I should have done. Uh, usually in the working uh, group level, let's say if there is a mistake happened that I, I couldn't uh, uh, get my voice out and I talk to wh while I'm in my meeting, uh, I have to do an appeal. I appeal against the chair of the working group. Maybe I'm uh, smart, more smart enough to not even like to do an appeal. So usually smart people, they just leave. They will not do an appeal. Uh, the system or the working system in uh, IETF, you have to do an appeal. Maybe people don't like to do that. Uh, so uh, 
and with the higher level of administration, let's say the IESG, uh, is there some kind of auditing are they doing? Because usually they are busy now. This is a volunteering job. So if they are a lot of, uh, they have a lot of work, we increase the number of EDs for per uh, uh, areas. Uh, that's good. But is there some kind of auditing? Are you auditing as admin LLC? Are you auditing uh, this kind of uh, 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 targeting the ch or achieving the milestones for the ADs and the uh, working group chair? Thank you. Thank you for that. So I, I replaced Sean because this is so straying a little bit into the standards process. So the, there's a pretty hard firewall between the LLC who administers the operations of the IETF and, and the ISG who oversees the standards process. And so no, the LLC does not um, is, is not involved in any appeals or any technical work. Um, if you did try and raise an issue with a working group share and you were brushed off, I'm, I'm very sorry, please raise it with a responsible area director. And I can guarantee you when it reaches that level, it will not uh, sort of uh, be brushed off. It will be taken seriously because an appeal is actually a formal action that, that the ISG takes very seriously and will respond to that. Mike. Mike Answer. So this question is both sort of general access to meetings, barriers to attending and keeping people returning, as well as the specific EDI slant to that, is can you share how going from fully virtual back to physical has affected you know, access and inclusion? Well, I, I, I personally think it's gotten better because there's more people that can come remote. And we, there's some of the hurdles that we had initially, like how are we going to do a home? Like they, we kind of have a tool now that like helps us with those things. Some people love it, some people hate it, but I think it does help. Um, do I personally think that the meetings will go fully virtual and then everybody will, uh, um, you know, always be remote? I think no, because I think some of the actual value of the meeting is the actual in hallway and personal conversations that you get to knock out a long technical topic in 20 minutes that you can't really do over via email. But that's my personal opinion. So, yeah. but, that, but that does bias the people who can afford both in money and in time and yes, in support of employers to Absolutely. be here. So um, we have significantly improved the process for remote participants. And um, part of that has meant sharing the pain so that on-site participa participants have had to um, change a number of their practices. Hums are far rarer now. The um, hand raising tool is used. Um, participant, local participants need to use MeTECO in order to be able to join the queue um, so that it's a unified queue. Um, so that has made a substantial um, benefit, I think, for remote participants. The area where we really haven't been able to um, uh, provide anything like the same level of experience is the social side of things, you know, the hallway and people getting to meet each other. That's something we would like to tackle, but it seems to be a general problem with um, this kind of meeting uh, across the world. So we've tried a number of experiments. They haven't worked that well, and we will continue to experiment. Tara. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to just, um, yeah, it was, it was great to hear about like what the diverse inclusion money is being spent on and idea like hopefully like that would continue across the upcoming years. And But just to clarify my earlier comment, I think what didn't come across is I'm talking that the scale of the challenge that's, uh, that's facing the ITF will needs a magnitude of order more investment in in, in diversity and inclusion. And yeah, how can you back to Mark's words uh, and also like what the questions are being asked in the chat, like what is significant support? Um, like I think yeah, instead of thinking about like fee waivers for a meeting, it's more a fellowship for a year or more, like some, something like that on that order. I'm not saying that that's the only way, but I'm just saying that like, um, we're talking about investments that are much more significant and support people for a longer time to be able to for them to retain because if you pay someone to attend for one meeting and then they come back the next meeting you can't wonder why they didn't come back like it's it's the situation has not been changed by one meeting and yeah, yeah, well, if just the, that's just if the average so, time to get an rfc out the door is three years your point is you paid me to come to one meeting and i gotta go to you know like you know eight more 
Like, how am I going to get here? Yeah. But again, like, I mean, our aspirational goal is big bucket of money that gets used for lots of stuff. So unfortunately, the way that's got to happen is people got to give us the money, right? But one thing we did <laughs> yeah. discuss, so the Internet Society used to run a technical fellows program, which is kind of what you described, right? They brought people in for, for I think, a series of meetings. And, and that, that achieved part of that goal. Um, it, they decided to stop that for various reasons that are, that are theirs. But we actually discuss on the LLC board and, and with the ISG whether the LLC can spin something up for, for that purpose. It would require like an order of magnitude more money because it's a significant investment and we would also need to come up with some community involvement process for sort of selecting those fellows, right? But it is something we have discussed and, and if this is something we should flesh out a bit more, especially if there's companies that would be interested in supporting that kind of outreach or whatever you want to call it, I think that would be useful. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think, like, I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's an easy problem to solve. I'm not saying like, oh, we should just, just raise this budget by this much and just move that lever. Uh, I recognize that it's, 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 it's a hard problem to solve. But when I think for me, it's just the, the, the key, like the key behind or why I sound a bit frustrated is because when someone brings it up and then the answer is we should do more outreach. It's like someone saying, hey, I'm incredibly ill. Why don't you have some tea? Like it's it's like I understand, yeah, outreach is good, but it won't solve a structural problem that is sure. not enough funding is going towards diversity and inclusion. And that's the point I hope just comes across. And thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think we recognize that this does take an order of magnitude greater effort. And that's both in resources, that's in commitment from people, and that's in the degree of consensus we have amongst the community. It, it, this requires a step change to achieve it, certainly. And, and there are many degree, there are many axes on which community, there's diversity, right? So there's, you know, you can list 12 real quickly, and we're not going to be able to do them all at once. So we're going to, you know, fits and starts and try to make things better. But that's kind of our goal with trying to get more money to do things, right? Um, that drains the queue. Oh. He was first over there. I was. The gentleman over oh, there was sorry. first. Pat, first. Yeah. Thanks. I'm Pat Kane. Uh, my computer died. Yeah. Um, hi, Texa. Uh, to deal with some of the issues that you're talking about, I think you have to think of it differently. Okay. In the 80s and 90s, back when nobody had gray hair, everybody was funded to come to the ITF, and you could go to six or seven because some government agency or somebody was giving you lots of money for it. In the 2000s, there were all these little companies who said, oh my God, you have to go to ITF because we're going to tell our VCs we have an RFC. And my God, they'll like buy us for $80 billion. Uh, and that's changed to the part where a lot of people now don't know the history or how things work or stuff like that. And when you talk to somebody, I talked to somebody and said, I'm going to the ITF for the first time in 20 years. And everybody said, wow, what's that? Um, and I can't point at their computer and say, Thank God for the IETF because your computer works. Uh, and so I would think about putting some push into publicity. Do the, hey, this is the IETF. This is why you want to send your people there. And some of the DEI stuff, some of the money things and stuff like that may just follow through once everybody gets back on the, hey, we actually know what this is. Okay. Take it under advisement. Cool. Hello, it's Peter Thomason. Um... So uh, I guess we're over the meeting time, which is why my on-site tool link already disappeared, so I'm not on the list. Um, so I, I find that this diversity discussion is um, very much focused on money, and I'm uh, a great proponent of um, diversity, but I think that um, there is many reasons why diversity could be lacking. One could be money for some people, and then for other people there might be other obstacles. And um, I think it would be quite worthwhile um, to... Um, I mean, I don't know, perhaps this has been done, but um, to, to look into why actually people feel or are underrepresented and then um, try to remove those barriers, which might include spending money on removing those, but it's not the same thing as giving stipends. Um, so it's just an observation from the discussion and I wanted to make that point. And um, another um, observation is um, it's been pointed out that some people come once or twice and then they don't come back. Maybe it's uh, because it's... Um, not what they were looking for. I mean, that could also happen. So I think we shouldn't jump to conclusions um, in such matters. 
I apologize if I slant the conversation to talk about money. I'm the treasurer. So that's why it's in the forefront of my mind. So I apologize if that's how it's coming off. I think we want to close the queue yes. also after Warren. So Warren Kamari, somewhat responding to what Tara said. Yes, I think we should try and make sure that people can come, but we also need to make really sure that when they do come, they feel welcome. So we should all make sure that, you know, when somebody arrives, if they're a newcomer or not, that we're actually being nice to them and treating them like people. That's it. Yeah. All right, cool. Great. Sure. Be quick, but that's be quick. It's a very quick response. Like, okay, so it's important that they feel welcome, but also like, let's not also infantilize like all the incredible people like that could be here in this room, but can't be here. Like the, there is a significant resource problem of coming here. And like, I mean, I can speak for myself. I can deal with like, I can deal with a couple of like mean people when I come here. It's not a big deal. I've dealt with much worse in my life. It's, it's, it's a problem that should still be solved, but it's not as like, it's not as for me, like, I just feel like there's not, it's not coming across the fact that the money challenge is, or it's not normal to me three times a year in, in really expensive hotels in different places. That's not, accessible to everyone and i just want to make sure that that's that's clear and until it, this is the only way that this work is being done that Im that imbalance needs to be addressed some way okay all right thanks we have closed the queue and i believe we're last on the agenda for tonight we are so have a great dinner oh let me put this thing up <laughs> Thank you.